Welcome to a new wave of entrepreneurship. I'm Latifa Farah, Associate Creative Producer at Venture for Canada and the producer of a new wave of entrepreneurship. The focus of this podcast is to hear from changemakers and Canadian entrepreneurs to learn about how they've developed their entrepreneur mindset and skills. In season five, we'll be chatting with CEOs, founders, and successful business leaders about their career journeys. We're excited to dive into these conversations about how to foster your entrepreneurial mindset and drive. We are very excited to have Mark Weissman on Venture for Canada's podcast, A New Wave of Entrepreneurship. Mark, how are you doing this afternoon? I'm great. Good afternoon, Scott. Great to be here. One of the things that we care a lot about at Venture for Canada is career development, and in particular, the career development of recent grads. Mark, what is one piece of advice that you would give to someone graduating from university or college? Um, well, look, I, first of all, I wish I was graduating from uh, university or college. Uh, it's, uh, you know, one of the best times, uh, one of the best times in life. And um, I think people that are, you know, graduating today or graduating uh, in the near future, um, you know, they should look forward uh, to that because they're opening up a whole new uh, set of opportunities uh, for themselves. So I wish I was, I wish I was graduating um uh now um frankly but there's three things and and i i'd like to think that i did these things uh, in my own career um that i encourage young people uh, to focus on uh, the first is uh to truly do something you're passionate about um i am a big believer that if you pursue your passion uh you'll work harder at it because you like doing it um if you like doing it uh, and work harder at it, it's uh, more likely that you're going to be successful. Um, and why not do something that you're both passionate about and, and successful at? So people who, you know, take jobs or pursue careers because, you know, they think that's the right thing to do or that's the path they should be on, um, I think that's crazy. I think you should follow something that you're truly interested in and passionate about. And, and the success, the money, everything else will, uh, will follow, uh, follow that. Uh, secondly, um, I'm a big believer um, in being global, and I don't think enough Canadians uh, are global. Our country is small. Uh, we are, in spite of its geographic size, quite insular. Uh, and I, I really think that if you have an opportunity earlier in your career uh, to study abroad, to live abroad, to work abroad, uh, particularly in a place where you're the other, um, that is a fantastic uh, experience. And in a place where you're a little bit uncomfortable, um, even uh, even better. And that experience will, it doesn't matter where you go, uh, that experience will uh, come back and pay dividends uh, in the long run. And the last thing I would say is, is, is you know, someone, if you're about to embark on on your professional careers, is, is, is take risk. Um, and that doesn't mean, you know, jump out of an airplane or go bungee jumping or, you know, you feel free to do that if that's what you want to do. Um, but I mean, in your career, take risk. And you know, that may be taking a job that nobody else wants to do. Um, that may be going back to school. Um, that may mean um, leaving a you know, secure job uh, to, pr to pursue something entrepreneurial. Um, because most people um, overestimate the downside risk um, and underestimate the upside. Uh, in terms of, of of taking professional risk, right? If you fail, so what? Pick yourself up and and start again. Um, and the rewards are often uh, much bigger than than people uh, people imagine. So, you know, for me, if I was graduating today, I I just you know remind myself, follow passion, be global, and take risk. A challenge that a lot of young people have is that they're given this advice, follow your passion, but then it brings this ex existential question of what is their passion? A lot of young people struggle with this question. I think a lot of people in life do. What advice do you have for a young person who is really unsure about what their passion is? Try a few things. And if you don't like it, change. Um, you know, it's not that big. It's not that big a deal. And, you know, I. Uh, uh, if you look at you know venture capital, uh, for example, um, and particularly in the U.S., and this is what you know sets the industry apart in the U.S., failure is okay, right? It's almost a badge of honor. Um, so it's not just failure in, in business ventures that's okay. It can be failure in you know stages of your of your career. Um, you know, at one point, I I had a had a job and. Um, you know, it turned out it was a, it was it was a big mistake, but I learned a lot from it, um, and I also learned 
uh, a lot about what I didn't want to do. Yeah, it's such an important point. And it's one of the things when giving advice to, to young people, I'll often say, do as many internships or work experiences as you can at the beginning of your career. Like if you can do 15 internships in, the, in five years, do 15 internships. Because each work experience gives you a little taste about what you like and what more importantly, in some ways, what you don't like. And it helps you on this path towards career clarity, which is something that I think all people go through in their lives. One thing I want to build on a little bit that you talked about earlier, Mark, is around risk aversion and how a lot of people are too risk averse when thinking about their careers. A common stereotype of Canadians is that we are too risk averse as a people, that risk aversion is something that is built into our culture. Do you think that that is a fair stereotype? I think that is to some extent. And I think that risk aversion uh, comes from the fact that many of us are quite comfortable, right? We live in a, uh, we live in a country um, that's you know, if not the best, one of the best countries in the world to live in. Uh, on a relative scale, um, most of us are, uh, you know, reasonably well off uh, financially. We're safe. Um, we have access to healthcare. We have access um, to education, um, and so we feel quite comfortable in Canada. And, and that's look, that's a that's a good thing. I'm I'm happy to live in a country um, and be from a country. Um, where many people feel relatively comfortable. Now, some feel more comfortable than others. Um, obviously, uh, you know, some, some groups of individuals um, uh, face uh, different challenges, including, uh, including racism um, and discrimination in our country. So not everybody feels comfortable, but by and large, relative to most places in the world, uh, Canadians feel quite comfortable. And so if you're comfortable, it's kind of, why bother? Uh, getting out of your, your your comfort zone, right? If you came from Ukraine today, um, you'd probably want you only to take more risk to leave your country and go somewhere go somewhere else. Um, if you've grown up in in a place uh, that has you know violence or or fear or where you know the the group of people who you're part of is discriminated against um, or there's poverty, you'd be willing to take more risk. Um, but I would say that you have to push through um, the, the place of comfort um, if you want to be successful. And Canada is a country that has been shaped by immigration in so many ways so that unless someone is of uh, Indigenous heritage, uh, uh, the vast majority of Canada's population are descendants uh, of immigrants. And there have been huge waves of immigration from Clifford Zipton in the early 1900s uh, to, to the, uh, today, where we're also experiencing some of the highest levels of immigration in Canada's history. So Mark, I know immigration is something that you know really well. You are the chair of the Century Initiative. And one of the Century Initiative's uh, crowning policy recommendations is for Canada's population to increase from approximately 38 million people today to 100 million people by the end of the century. Why is this goal so important? Well, look, the goal's, uh, the goal's important. And let's, let's be clear, uh, you know, we say 100 million people, that sounds, that sounds crazy. Um, but in fact, uh, you know, we've got uh, about 78 years or so uh, to get there. And if you look at the pace of growth in Canada over the last, uh, the last century, if you look at the pace of growth in Canada over the 20th century, uh, the pace of growth uh, was even higher than what we're suggesting uh, with, the, with the Century Initiative. And, and look, scale matters. Um, and so in, in Canada, if we want to remain relevant as a country and if we want to have a robust economy where we can, can continue to be comfortable and have access to health care access to uh education uh, a high standard of living um we have to create uh, the requisite gdp and per capita gdp to be able to drive that particularly with an aging population that is going to live longer and put more of a drain particularly in their later years um, on our social services. So, you know, we're a big country physically. Um, we can easily accommodate uh, more people um, and having more people will create a more robust uh, economy, a more robust uh, country. And, and hopefully something I know you wanna talk about, um, hopefully um, have an impact on improving our lagging uh, productivity measures. On the topic of infrastructure, something that it seems like is a huge challenge of, that our country faces is getting large infrastructure projects actually built and getting them built relatively quickly. 
One thing that has definitely generated a lot of media coverage over the last year or two is the Canadian Infrastructure Bank. Do you think the Canadian Infrastructure Bank was a well thought out concept? Um, you know, I think the idea of the Infrastructure Bank and the concept around it um, made and continues to make a lot of sense, which is finding ways uh, essentially to crowd in using government money uh, to crowd in uh, private capital um, to build critical infrastructure for the country, um, which will have positive externalities uh, in terms of um, in terms of business activity. And I always go back. One of the examples I always I always talk about is is the St. Lawrence Seaway, uh, which was completed in the in the mid 1950s, and by the way was paid for primarily by Canada because the U.S. didn't want to pay for it. And you look at the the even in today's dollars, the amount that was spent on that massive project uh, to connect, uh, of course, um, the upper Great Lakes to the lower Great Lakes, and in particular, uh, the Welland Canal to, to, to allow uh, ship traffic to go from Lake Erie to, uh, to Lake Ontario. Um, the positive externalities of that are still being paid today, right? It's allowed us to get our agricultural uh, products to market. It's allowed us to get our natural resources to market. It's created a massive amount of, of efficiency um, that's paid itself back in taxes and growth, you know, probably hundreds of times, hundreds and hundreds of times over. So we have to think about projects like that, that are going to, where we can crowd in private capital, where we can create um, positive externalities. And I think done right, an infrastructure bank uh, like the one uh, conceived by the uh, Growth Council um, uh, should be able to be uh, successful. Whether the current incarnation of that bank has achieved that yet or not, I'll let others, uh, you know, I'll let others uh, opine on. Um, but conceptually, conceptually, this is the type of thing um, that government ought to be spending money on. And um, because of the positive, we, we talk about all the negative externalities in the world, right? We talk about all the ex negative externalities associated uh, with uh, carbon emissions and climate change and all, all, all of those uh, types of things. Well, infrastructure has positive externalities um, and we have to figure out how we um, create more, more of those. And I would say, um, you know, uh, an infrastructure bank uh, should be able to do it. Um, and, you know, I think this one's had it uh, had its teething pains, but, um, you know, hopefully it'll it'll be able to uh, uh, increasingly achieve that achieve that end. On a separate topic, uh, one of the things that we've talked a lot about uh, on the Venture for Canada podcast is Canada's late, lagging labor productivity growth. Uh, and in particular, why Canada lags the United States is something we talked into a fair, a fair amount of detail with Goldie Hyder, who's the CEO of the Business Council of Canada. So Mark, why do you think uh, Canada's labor producti productivity growth lags our peers such as the United States? And what do you think Canada can do uh, to catch up our labor productivity growth with our peer countries? So, so let me tell you, I think this is the most important uh, question that um, our policymakers need to be focused on. So if we wanna be successful and continue to enjoy um, those uh, those comforts in our uh, in our country. Um, we need to ensure that we don't just have growth in GDP, um, much of which is driven uh, by just having more people. Uh, we have to ensure that we have a productivity growth, which drives GDP per capita. And we are behind and we are falling farther and farther behind. Um, some of that relates to a lack of critical infrastructure and, and, and a huge infrastructure deficit in this country that we've been slow to make up. The US is, is moving uh, much more uh, much more quickly in, in, in that regard, uh, particularly um, under the, uh, the Biden administration, um, but not just under the Biden administration, even, even before that. Um, secondly, um, we, uh, we need uh, uh, to ensure that uh, the private sector is encouraged to spend more on research and development to achieve uh, achieve productivity uh, uh, productivity gains through 
the application of technology and 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 other uh, other other methodologies. Our private sector isn't investing enough. Part of that, the private sector is to blame, but part of that is because uh, the right government structures and incentives aren't in place. And then, most importantly, in my view, it's an investment in human capital. We are under, yeah, everybody talks about capital and they think about infrastructure, let's build a bridge, let's build a road, let's build an airport, let's build a pipeline. Um, but the input to any business is both is both capital in terms of money and human capital, which is which is labor, right? That's that's sort of you know economics 101. And so we need to invest equally in our country um, in not just productive physical capital, we also have to invest in productive human capital. What does that mean? It means skilling people appropriately. It means reskilling people if they don't have uh, the skills that are uh, that are required. It means uh, being aggressive and strategic in bringing people into our country who have those skills that are going to carry us uh, along and understanding that in fact, there is a global war for talent. For our listeners, if you're interested in learning more about this critical subject, and I completely agree with Mark, I think that this is the subject that is of the most importance that is almost never talked about, which is a tragedy, I think, for Canada. An excellent book is Innovation in Real Places by Dan Bresnitz, uh, who runs uh, innovation policy studies at the University of Toronto's Monk School. Uh, and it's fantastic and talks about kind of how do we get to this quandary? Uh, and I think part of it has been, uh, we need to be more innovative a, a, as a country, and we also need to be more growth focused uh, as a country. So one thing of related to this subject, Mark, that I think is interesting is, yes, the United States on a per capita basis is uh, increasing its gap with, with Canada. But at the same time, the United States is becoming an increasingly economically unequal society. That sometimes it seems like as a Canadian looking at the United States and as a Canadian who has lived in the U.S. for five years, that American society is beginning to fray, even with all of its wealth, even with uh, the fact that it spawns companies like Amazon and Apple and, and many, many, many others. So You've also uh, done a lot of work around how do we focus capital in the long term? How do we build inclusive uh, capitalism? What advice do you have for Canadian policymakers on how to both sustain, enhance economic growth, but also do it in a way that ensures that it is shared relatively equitably, or at least there's not the same significant level of inequality that exists in the United States? Well, yeah, but let's not make the Scott. Let's not make the mistake here of thinking that productivity and redistribution um, are, are, op are opposites, right? In fact, higher productivity will give us more wealth to redistribute. So it's, it's those two things are actually aligned with one another, right? Having um, businesses and enterprises that are more successful, that are more efficient, that are producing uh, more GDP per capita, um, gives us more options and more choices on how we might want to redistribute uh, that capital because we have more of it for every person in the country. And to clarify, I agree. I think we need to be both pro-labor productivity growth, pro-economic growth, and pro uh, how do we build a more equitable economy. It's to say that the U.S. model is good in some ways, but also really bad, bad in other ways. And we should look to them as role models, probably with regards to economic growth, but perhaps not with regards to social conditions. Yeah. And there's parts of the social conditions that are, you know, again, um, you know, we should, we should look, um, we should look at all kinds of examples around the world. We should look to Scandinavia. We should look to Germany. We should look to Australia. We should look to Japan and we should look uh, to the United States. So, you wrote a uh, great op-ed earlier this year, Mark, that was about lessons learned from the pandemic and uh, how the government should, governments in general should look to collaborate more with the private sector when it comes to crisis management. Can you elaborate a little bit more on this subject? Yeah, and this really stems from a piece that uh, Jay Clayton, who uh, uh, is the former uh, chair of the SEC in the US and I wrote, uh, first appeared in, uh, in Barron's um, and then um, there was a sort of a, uh, then there was a piece that I wrote in the Globe that uh, uh, kind of picked up on some of the themes. Um, and I think, you know, I don't have it uh, open in front of me, but, but what is, 
really important in terms of uh, crisis management. And, and Bill Gates, in his new book, uh, uh, writes on a very in a very similar vein. It, it, a lot of it has to come uh, from first of all from preparation. Um, you know, it's too late to buy insurance after the house is on fire, and so we have to be looking around the corner to the next crisis, um, uh, and uh, and thinking about whether it's a pandemic or something else. It could be a, it could be a weather event. Uh, it could be another financial crisis. It could be an operational crisis. Um, we need to be looking around the corner and make sure that we are uh, building resiliency into our system um, ahead of the crisis and that we have expert agencies um, that are appropriately funded uh, by government um, to be able to practice um, and be prepared uh, for, for the crisis that, that will befall us. And undoubtedly, the crisis is the crises, sorry, that we prepare for, um, you know, will not be the exact ones that befall us, but but having the preparation uh, in place um, gives you the the uh, expertise and and resiliency uh, to deal with it. And if you go back, uh, you know, to 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 uh, New York City, for example, and we talked about this in the article, um, you know, in the 1940s. Um, you know, New York was better at getting people vaccinated and more efficient because public health was more robust um, than um, uh, against, uh, among other things, polio, um, than uh, the, um, uh, then we were able to vaccinate people today in, in the 2020s um, because public health had been, has been, uh, has been hollowed, uh, hollowed out and it took us a long time uh, to get up to speed, not just on vaccine production, but also uh, vaccine uh, distribution. So the first thing is having uh, appropriate uh, public agencies um, that are prepared. Uh, that's your insurance policy. You got to buy insurance before before the fire starts. The second thing is our governments have lost the ability. It's not just in Canada. It's 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 in the West writ large that governments have lost the ability. Uh, to, in part because they've been hollowed out, um, but to really um, operationalize um, the policy decisions that are made. So we've got lots of people in government that are are good at thinking about uh, about um, about policy, but we have less people in government that have actual experience running stuff. And as a result of that, when you have a crisis. It's very hard, even if you have the right policy intentions, to uh, to to uh, to implement. And so, you know, part of the view that we have when we wrote the piece was that, you know, there needs to be a higher uh, degree of operational expertise uh, in government, and no small measure of that operational expertise can come from the private sector, and can come from the private sector partnering with government uh, to achieve um, those ends for society. And you go back to wartime, you know, it wasn't the government uh, making tanks and airplanes. It was the private sector that shifted the means of production from making automobiles to making tanks and planes um, that, uh, that led uh, to uh, the allies uh, winning, uh, winning the second world war. And so, you have to not just have the operational expertise in government, but you have to have the ability to collaborate and integrate with the private sector to get that get that done. There's an excellent book uh, by Mariana Masucato that came out last year called Mission Economy. And in this book, there's a great chapter about the Apollo mission and the United States mission to send a man to the moon. And at the peak, it was something like half a million people worked on the Apollo project in the equivalent of 5% of the US federal budget. And it involved hundreds of different companies and a level of coordination that I think is hard to, to say. I think the reason I bring this up is to say public sector can do great things in collaboration with private sector as Operation Warp Speed shows. But one of the things Mary Mazzucato talks in her book is that one of the reasons why governments aren't good at delivering the goods in a lot of cases is because the, from an HR perspective, they've been starved of resources, that 
a trend over the last 20 or 30 years has been to outsource everything when it comes to government, which in essence robs government agencies of their in-house capabilities, and in particular, an over-reliance on, on third-party uh, consultants. So to your point, and I think a critical piece of how do you build up the leadership? How do you build up the HR capacity, the human talent within these government uh, agencies? What advice would you have for policymakers on how to attract more talent uh, into the, the public service? Bring, bring the private sector in, work more closely with the private sector. And I've, I've talked about this at, at length. Um, governments in Canada, I believe, uh, my observation would be have increasingly been afraid uh, of the private sector. And, and I think that's, you know, everything is there's there's private sector is trying to take some advantage. Uh, the private sector is doing something it's only wants to do things that are unethical. The private sector is, you know, motivated just by lining its own own pockets and, and, and you know, uh, profiteering, et cetera, et cetera. And I, I think that's a, a, a terrible um, attitude uh, to have. And, 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 and to be clear, the private sector, you know, by some of its actions, uh, deserves some blame for that, that view being held by many in, uh, by many in government. Um, but I think the private sector is willing to help. I think the private sector, um, you know, yes, there is a profit motive, but that profit motive is back to focusing capital in the long term. It is increasingly focused on on a long term profit motive, which means you know if you're operating in a robust and safe uh, society where people want to work and people want to spend, um, you know that's good for your long term uh, profitability. And increasingly, as we've seen, um, companies also understand they they need a social license to operate, and and part of that uh, social license to operate means that you know. Um, you can't wake up every morning um, and be nothing but a rapacious capitalist, right? You 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 have to uh, you have to um, have a license to operate um, in the country, society, city, community um, where you're located, where your customers are, where your employees are. So I think the private sector has actually come a long way in that regard, and I think this idea of stakeholder capitalism is, has has helped um, um, companies understand it. I think more what's even more important is that focusing on long-term value creation. Uh, you know, when I when I talk about a quarter, I like to think about it as being 25 years, not not three months. Um, and so I think as business moves more in that direction, um, it's more and more willing to help and be part of the solution. Um, but I also think it, need, it you, you need government to be willing to engage uh, with business and not see business as as the enemy. And and today. Um, and I think it's particularly an issue in Canada. Um, those many policymakers, I think, uh, continue to see business as the enemy um, and part of the problem is, as opposed to uh, a critical part of the solution. If you do that, you'll get more people willing to go into government, uh, more businesses willing to collaborate with government. Um, and uh, and and you can create a better a better common uh, common outcome. And as we said earlier, um, you know, a greater the greater creation the greater creation of of of, of GDP um, allows there to be um, more capital to be redistributed to to meet social ends. So if you don't have if you don't have there's no sense redistributing zero. It doesn't go very far. It takes two to tango, and to your point, it is important to have a willing, uh, willing engagement from both private sector and government. We talked about this subject a little bit with John Nubley, who's the former Deputy Minister of Innovation, Science, and Economic Development. And one of the things he observed from his close to 40-year career in government is how it's much more challenging to leave the civil service and then go into government and then go back into government versus when he talked to counterparts in the United States, it was much more common to have okay, someone joins an administration for a few years, they then go back to the private sector, uh, et, et cetera. I'm sure you probably have lots of friends uh, in the United States who have served uh, in different administrations at, at various points. So, and a part of that is a function of the fact that the president, I think, appoints approximately 4,000 people uh, or indirectly appoints. 
Do you think that, that the structure of the Canadian government should be evolved so that there are more appointments, so that there are more people coming in and serving a relatively short time uh, in, in government? I think we can do a lot more of it. Of course, the structure of the parliamentary system uh, compared to um, the sort of presidential system uh, in the in the US, um, you know, leads to different outcomes, right? In, in Canada, the executive branch um, and other parliamentary systems, the, the executive branch and the, and the legislative branch are essentially merged in, 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 in parliament. Whereas in the U.S., there's a much clearer distinction between the executive branch and the legislative branch, which is uh, which is you know, uh, Congress is is solely uh, legislative in nature, and and the president obviously has control over the executive branch that then allows for the appointments and so on and so forth. So you know, I do think we have to recognize our system is different, but working within our system, um, I think we can be doing a lot more. Uh, we can be doing a lot more to uh, encourage. Um, uh, people to to go into government. Part of that is a cultural thing. Part of it is just making the rules uh, easier um, in, in terms of uh, you know uh, you know when when people leave government being 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 unable to do all kinds of stuff afterwards for a, for a longer period of time. Um, and I, I think there's models. Um, you know, if you look to Singapore, for example, where you have a much uh, much more integrated, small country, but a much more integrated approach um, to people also like the U.S., people coming in and out of uh, uh, between the public service and um, uh, and the private sector. So we can do more of it in Canada. Part of it is, again, the benefit of, of and there's lots of problems with the system, as we know, in the U.S., but one of the benefits uh, of the system in the U.S. is its ability to bring in through appointment uh, people into the executive branch and then have them uh, uh, sort of cycle cycle through. I'd like to see more of it in Canada, a lot more of it, and um, it's going to take a change of attitude to do that. Yeah, there's pros and cons. Certainly, many people have read critiques about uh, people who work in financial institutions then being regulators. But then on the flip side as well, there's lots of benefits of right. I mean, insight if you've actually worked in an industry to then be on the regulator side. That's just one snapshot, but it's to say, I think to your point that there. Are, Having uh, more fresh blood going in and out of government, I think in general, uh, is something that, that would probably uh, benefit uh, Canada and is worth exploring. We, we do look, we do have examples in Canada where this has worked well. So I don't want to say that it's, it's you, know, um, you know, we've had people come in and out of Department of Finance, including Michael Sabia, who've been, you know, spent careers, um, you know, um, pivoting between uh, the public sector and the private sector. And uh, I just think we need more of them. Oh, I agree. There's certainly great examples. On the East Coast, uh, currently the president of the Atlantic Canada Opportunities Agency is Francis McGuire, who was an entrepreneur and businessman for most of his life uh, and also worked in the Frank McKenna government. And I think it's a great example of someone who has uh, gone between the two, but it is not as common as it probably should be. And certainly far less common than in the United States and a lot of other countries. On a uh, final note, Mark, one thing you've written about recently is on the topic of natural resources in Canada and how natural resources is something that we are uh, underinvesting in as a country, that it's in some ways a missed opportunity. Uh, at the same time, you're also the co-founder of Focus and Capital on the Long Term. By the way, we've had Alison Lote on the podcast, who uh, was uh, part of the team, and she's spoken a little bit about her work there. Do you believe that investments in natural resources and oil and gas uh, that that can align with the uh, at the same time with the focus on capital in the long term, on long term thinking? How do you reconcile that focus on natural resources and focusing on the long term at, at the same time? Well, first of all, focusing on the long term doesn't mean you 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 know set it and forget it, right? Focusing on the long term means that you have long term objectives in mind, but you have to be constantly as conditions evolve. Um, you know, changing your tactic. So, so you know, let's be clear. It's not like you know, let's 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 set let's set a, a business objective. You know, go away and we'll come back twenty five years later and see how it turned out. I mean, you do have to continue to uh, uh, continue to be tactical uh, in the way that you operate. And you know, what I've argued is right now um, it's time to be tactical. First of all, we need to understand um, that we're not turning off. Uh, fossil fuels because we can't, unfortunately, um, tomorrow, that there needs to be a transition um, to a lower carbon 
uh, economy and to lower carbon sources of uh, sources of energy. And so it's impossible that we don't have a, a, uh, uh, a, a transition and there isn't a role uh, in particular for natural gas um, during the, the transition period. And given where pricing is today, um, you know, do um, sadly to the unfortunate events uh, in Ukraine, um, we should be taking advantage as a country um, of that high pricing and ensuring um, that our commodities are getting to market. That doesn't mean um, that we're not at the same time uh, trying to lower our carbon footprint. It doesn't, in fact, it should allow us to move more rapidly uh, to invest in transition because there's more capital around and more profit around um, to be able to do that. It also means that we should be figuring out how we get our agricultural resources to market, right? We're going to see, uh, particularly this fall, um, we've already seen, but we're going to see unprecedentedly high uh, commodity prices in the agricultural sector, um, something that Canada is great at. What are we doing uh, to truly take advantage of that as a country? What are we doing to move our product um, to the places that it's needed? Not just to make a, a profit, by the way, um, but to ensure um, that those countries that have heretofore had to rely on Russian or, or Ukrainian uh, wheat or sunflower oil, for example, um, have, let's call it a more ethical alternative um, by purchasing um, those products um, from, uh, from, from Canada. And so, um, you know, in, in my mind, <laughs> we should, you know, quite literally be making uh, hay while the sun shines right now. Um, and, um, and, and there's no reason uh, why we can't be doing that and financing uh, the transition to a lower, uh, lower carbon economy and lower carbon energy uh, at the same time. And in fact, maybe financing it more aggressively uh, with the proceeds from $100 plus um, oil and, and uh, expensive natural gas. Mark, it has been super enjoyable speaking with you today. We have covered a really wide range of topics, everything from Canadian immigration policy to Canadian labor productivity growth to how do we build a more equitable society and how do we balance growth and, and economic distribution and uh, ideally do it at the same time uh, and a wide range of other subjects. We really appreciate you coming on the podcast this afternoon. Thanks so much. Thanks, Scott. Pleasure to be here. That's it for this week's episode of A New Wave of Entrepreneurship. Stay connected with us via our social and our email list. Subscribe to us in your favorite podcast app so that you don't miss our next episode. If you have feedback on today's episode, tweet us at Venture4Canada, that is Venture, the number four, Canada, or email us at podcast at Venture4, that's spelled F-O-R, Canada.ca. We'd love to hear from you. Thanks for listening. I'm Scott Stewart, and until next time, stay safe, stay motivated, and stay grateful. A New Wave of Entrepreneurship is produced by Winita Lee Garcia and Latifa Farah. Editing and mixing also done by Latifa Farah. Erica Ormiston is our editorial assistant. Mark Wallach and Premium Beat own the copyright and publishing rights related to the song used in this podcast. The comments and opinions, recommendations, or suggestions expressed on the podcast by the guests are not liable to Venture for Canada and belong solely to each individual. Any information provided stated by our guests and our host is independent of Venture for Canada. A new wave of entrepreneurship is a Venture for Canada brand and all content is owned by Venture for Canada. If you'd like to use our content, please reach out to us at podcast at venture4, that's spelled F-O-R, Canada.ca.